Thank you. Uh, it's really nice to be here and to share some information about Ukraine with you. And before my main speech, uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude and respect to all the people, including my close friends, who are now actively saving, evacuating archives, museums, exhibits, archaeological artifacts, and other cultural attributions in Ukraine during the war. And I would like also to dedicate this presentation to the brilliant architect Tatyana Belayeva, who passed away on November 1st. And I will certainly mention her and her archive later in my presentation. So, uh, I think, as you know, during the 20th century, Ukrainian has a very difficult uh, history, as well as very difficult history of uh, architecture. And in general, its history was much more turbulent. First uh, World War, uh, then uh, a revolution, during which a lot of monuments were destroyed. Then uh, Second World War, after which not uh, just exactly monuments, but the cities uh, at all were destroyed. You can see on this picture the main street in Kyiv, Kreshatik. But uh, nevertheless, uh, after each war or disaster, Ukraine stands uh, up and rebuild itself. Uh, and after the Second World War, it was the period of so-called uh, Stalinist high uh, classicism, during which uh, a lot of uh, buildings and ensembles were built, uh, like instance you see here on the left side, Fair Trade Center and on the right side rebuilt Kreshatik Street. And after this, a new uh, state program. Uh, so I need to say that during the whole 20th century, architecture history of Ukraine was much more connected to uh, the government state uh, policy. And this program of building new and uh, numerous square meters of living uh, spaces for people take uh, place after uh, Khrushchev's uh, decree. But perhaps, uh, despite all difficulties, um, people are standing, and unfortunately, after 24th of November, a new war came uh, to Ukraine, and a lot of monuments and places are in danger or already destroyed, and it consists of uh, monuments uh, and masterpieces, landmarks of the old periods uh, of uh, the architecture, as well of the 20th century. Like on this picture, you see a cultural palace in Kharkiv, uh, made in a style of constructivism that was was sheltered by uh, the Russian troops. Or uh, you can see here a glorious and beautiful monument, the biggest monument made in the style of Cubism in the 30s by a famous Ukrainian artist, Ivan Kavaliridze. And unfortunately, it's situated right uh, around uh, the battlefields that are still happening there. And it was partly damaged. And for sure, a lot of uh, examples of architecture of the second half of the 20th century uh, are in danger, like this one. Uh, it's ice sport palace in Severodonetsk with the beautiful mosaics all around its exterior and uh, a beautiful interior with a lot of uh, greenery plants and trees. But unfortunately, it was completely damaged after the bomb shelling. Or another one not far away from Severodonetsk uh, that was also so burnt out, uh, or this uh, universities in Mykolaiv, the first one and uh, the second one. But uh, Ukrainians uh, never give up, and uh, people by themselves also trying to protect uh, uh, buildings. And on this photo, you see uh, monuments in Kyiv that are covered, sheltered by the people, by themselves, uh, using all materials they can find somewhere, like sandbags, or concrete uh, structures like uh, you see on uh, these photos. So uh, despite the old difficulties, the main symbol, and I can say the outpost, bastion of architecture in Ukraine, still remains the state scientific research library of architecture and construction, named after Vladimir Zabolotny. During my speech, I will call it simply the library. In Ukraine, there is still no museum of architecture or research center 
center, but there is this library. And it is, from my point of view, not only a library, but also a museum, a scientific architectural center, holding conferences and exhibitions. And the main asset of the library is its book collection. During the library existence, about 400,000 copies of unique national and world literature on architecture, construction, urban planning, fine, decorative, applied arts have been collected in the collection. The library collections also include books and pamphlets, magazines, normative documents, dissertations and illustrations. And in addition to its rich collection of books and catalogues, you can also find in it original architectural drawings, blueprints, or you can find a lot of photo material from a unique photo bank that uh, collects uh, photos from different other archives of previous scientific institutions. But the only thing it may lack is architectural models, but even that can be corrected. Personally, I shared with the library three original models, two from the 1980s and one from the 1990s. So the history of the library began 63 years ago simultaneously with the creation of the Academy of Architecture of Ukrainian Soviet State. For six decades, the library has passed the way from scientific academic to scientific state library. But during its history, its names have changed, but the main tasks, directions, and the essence of its activity have remained unchanged. From the very beginning, the scientific library was cared by the staff of the whole academy, from the president to the workers of the academic bindery. They were highly professional specialists, persons who were not indifferent to their work, culture, art, and books. And one of these personalities was the first president of the academy, a scientist and a public figure, founder of the library, Vladimir Ignatievich Zabolotny, in the name of whom library is named now days. And Zabolotny is legendary figure not only in the history of architecture, but in Ukraine in general. He was one on the equal with the generals, all the leaders of the country, and he was personally involved in all matters relating to the organization of the library. So, uh, speaking about archives of the second half of the 20th century, now I would like to divide it in two groups of archives. The first archives of former scientific design Institute, and the second one is personal archives of the architects. After the collapse of the USSR, each scientific institute went through its own dramatic path of transition from a planned system to a market economy. Private studios were opened on the basis of the former state-owned studios. The urge to open up a new world of possibilities, quickly forgetting the past, was also reflected in the legacy of the architecture of the Soviet times. Unspoken architecture, as well as unspoken memory of the 60s and 80s was discredited. The past was thrown into the dustbin of the history, both literally and figuratively. Perhaps the most telling example in this respect is the main design institute in Kyiv, named Kyiv Project. It can be argued that after the Second World War, almost all of the Kyiv city was designed at this institute. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, the institute was reformated several times and divided between several owners. The building of the institute was rented out and a few years ago it was sold and now demolishing, even though Ukraine is at war and Kyiv is regularly bombed. But the history of the archive of this institute and in the fact archive of the history of Kyiv is a very complicated story. The archive itself was sold to a bank, to a commercial bank, and again divided among the owners. Before that, I tried to get there for 10 years in a row, but it turned out to be impossible. I was told both that it didn't exist or that I just can't get in. But I managed to get there once, just before the demolition of the Building Institute began. What I saw was deeply disappointing. A unique, infinitely important and interesting study material was, terrifying, was in terrifying conditions. I could say it was just a pile of junk. My attempts to negotiate for it to be handed over to the library 
even with the help of lawyers, were unsuccessful. The fact is that the current owners of this archive do not understand its value and its significance. They are just businessmen, and at the same time, they do not make any money out of it either, because for that it needs to be sorted and kept in the proper conditions at least. It's just lying around because of the greed and uneducation of the people who have the key to it. I also tried to save it through the architects who used to work in it. But here starts another very complicated legal issue of copyrights, because in the USSR everything belonged to the state and the orders were also from the state. Therefore, there is no legal framework to protect copyrights, in spite of the fact that all projects have signatures of all authors, of all architects, they are not able to prove their direct authorship. Another scientific uh, design giant institute, the unique experimental institute, Kivznieb, and its archive has the similar story. Much of it was also thrown away after the people of the president Yanukovych privatized the institute building and they removed the archive to undisclosed location. However, I have long been in contact with a famous and legendary Ukrainian photographer Viktor Marushenko. He used to work for the Soviet culture magazine and did a great material on various events. Among others, he took material of the 20th anniversary of this scientific institute, Kievsnieb, and he kindly presented to me all his archives on all architects as well as uh, the archive of Kiev's Neb. And going through this archive, we can see the material of the institute, of the institute, and we can see briefly but richly the life of the institutions. For instance, its legendary director Alexei Zavarov, who headed the institute during the 30s years, and it was he who invented like manifesto, the formula of this of this institution that was called idea, experiment, project, and production. So for this, he built a small experimental factory where all experiments took place with all material and all kind of projects. Or we can see a famous group of Valentin Stolko. Uh, this group was uh, highly developed, uh, a special uh, kind of bigness uh, constructions with high span buildings that lately were used in such uh, projects as marketplaces or furniture houses. Or we can see the department of first computer design, a unique phenomenon for those years. So uh, this uh, architect's trying to invent uh, like first uh, computer theories in producing mass housing projects. And uh, another institute, the first design institute of the USSR time, still formally exists, and its name is Giprograd. But its archive is, I would say, in a good condition. However, access to it can also be said not, uh, can said to be denied. Nevertheless, thanks to my diplomacy, delicious chocolates, and the love of a charming archivist, I managed to work there a lot. And I and uh, this. Uh, Archivist Veronika, she is on the right a photo, and you see like the whole mood of the archivists, uh, architectural archivists in Kiev. And I spent there so much time, so I need even sometimes to pick up my kid with his friends while I was working there. They were playing there and watching all the books, especially uh, with uh, the pictures. And uh, the most important thing that I managed to do was to scan many materials of my own by prior personal agreement with the archivists. The institute is, pra is uh, practically bankrupt, so its fate is not stable either, and it's possible that my scans can remain its only evidence. And I did the same thing with another institute, Giprograždan Promstroy, which designed mostly uh, industrial kind of architecture as well as other projects and experimental projects like this one. And going through this archive, I found such projects, uh, projects as this that I never seen before and uh, that were never built as well. 
And another group of archives uh, can be classified as architects' private archives. It is essentially everything they have managed to get out of their previous institute work or of some other reasons, they have left it at home. As for difficulties of working, as the main difficulties of working in this field of archiving is uh, to gain the trust of this elder people, elder architects, explain to them that my interest the, is in the importance of archiving and scanning and of course of transferring everything to the library, to explain to them that they should not keep it lying around and that the history of architecture of the 60s and 80s is important and interesting. Because from my perspective, the main task of the archive is to work with archive, and archive is alive when it is at work. Uh, for instance, I spent a lot of time working together with architect, with architect uh, Edward Bilski, who is standing in front of his main building, Pioneer Palace in Kyiv. And it took uh, some time while Bilski uh, believed in me, and uh, later we became close friends. And I detailed and uh, carefully arranged everything uh, from his archive, put everything in its right place and in its folders. And after Bilski's death, his only relative family member gave to me, unfortunately, not everything, and I can explain where the rest went. But everything I received from him, I passed and transferred on to the library with detailed description. And I tried to uh, establish relations with Tatyana Belayeva as well as with Edward Bilski. Uh, Tatyana's Belayeva memory I honored at the beginning of my report. And as well as with Bilski, for a long time, uh, after a long time of uh, spending with her, she believed in me, and things go better, and we made a lot of publication of her work. And her main work was this pioneer, uh, camp in Crimea that was called uh, the Seagull, and uh, she was awarded uh, the main, uh, the highest Soviet architectural prize for this uh, project, for design of this project, and it was also unexpected for those time when a woman architect won this kind of honor. And during the construction of the Pioneer Camp, a seagull, she personally photographed and documented the entire construction process. And when the project was finished, she made a photo album of the entire history of the project and of uh, the all periods of her supervision during the building process. And furthermore, she traveled extensively around the world as a head of the Komsomol organization. And after each trip, she created a scrapbook of all the tickets, postcards, photos, and sketches she made during her trips. And this is, in my opinion, is also, it has a great value. And uh, it's, uh, and she, uh, sent all her archive because uh, before she passed away to the library and it's great that we can now have everything uh, carefully prepared for uh, next generations. In a similar way, I scanned and selected the archive of the architect Gopkola, who was working in the Kiev project and was also one of the main like architects of the Kiev project as well of the architecture. And also I scanned and searched the archive of architect Yablonsky, uh, who had a unique uh, history of his architectural approach because he was one of the first experiment uh, architects in the producing mass housing and it was he who also worked at the Kiev's Nep University and uh, worked with the first uh, computers technologies to produce new topology of uh, the living space and as Belayeva he also filmed all the process of building for instance you can see on this photo the building of the first panel house in Kyiv, in which he lived, as well all uh, members of the Academy of Architecture of Ukraine lived. And his daughter, now a teacher at the Faculty of Architecture nowadays, is also living in this house, and it was she who gave me all his archive. Also, there is uh, like other side of the private archive, let's say a black market in architectural archives. And on this photo, you can see like each shop of the one of uh, architect's archive. 
And the, uh, the fact is that during the 90s and 2000 time, many antique dealers already imagined the value of these architectural archives and bought them up from architects or stole them from the institutes. And now I know a few people who sell all these archives for a lot of money. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it can cost too much money to buy the whole uh, archive. And also, when many architects die, their families do not appreciate the importance of the archive left behind. They also don't want to hand them over to the library because they think they can make money on it. They sell them to the antique markets at a very low price, but the sellers afterwards put a big price on them. So the sad thing is that the completeness of the archive is lost and someone can buy a few photos or drawings separately, but to buy an archive in general, the whole archive for the whole price, I think is possible only thanks to the foundations and grants. And at the same time, there is another problem. For example, if you are not the author or a family member of this or that architect, it is very difficult to transfer the archive to the library because of the legal norms of bureaucracy. However, there are positive stories when private archives remain intact. One major example is the archive of the creative couple of the artists Ada Rybachuk and Volodymyr Melnichenko, who worked together extensively with the architects. And their most important work is the memory wall in the Kyiv crematorium, a huge, huge sculptural wall that uh, on which uh, uh, they worked for about 20 years, and then one day the state officials decided to concrete it over just to destroy it adding a new layer of the concrete and the rest of their lives they fought to open it again from the concrete sarcophagus and uh, on this photo there is Volodymyr Menichenko who is still alive but unfortunately Ada died 2014 so uh, and partly Finally, this concrete was uh, taken partly off, and this happened uh, a couple years ago. And encouraged by this event, many people have reached out to help Volodymyr to offer or to create his own foundation of uh, his and others' heritage. And their workshop in the center of Kyiv, their studio where Volodymyr is uh, living as well and is connected to his studio, now it's like a living museum museum of their work, of their archive, where everything has been preceded, described and digitalized. It also hosts exhibitions and other events, not only related to their work. And on this photo you can see one of the members of uh, their like foundation standing in front of this concrete wall that was taken off partly a few years ago. And uh, another great example of preserving the archive is not in Kyiv, but in Lviv, and it's archive of the architect Konsolov. It is a unique uh, archive in its quality, quantity, and preservation. Moreover, this archive is uh, like situated, is hosted in his beautiful studio where he worked for a long time. So the Lviv center of the history suggested and invited Konsolov granddaughter to digitalize the archive and in order to have it digitally copies and digitally accessible and to have a guarantee uh, of its preservation for the future as well. And this has been done and it can be now used and it was even uh, uh, some uh, exhibitions connected to this car archive or with using this archive in uh, Lviv. And some more uh, examples of how we can use archive. This was exhibition in 2015 that was called Superstructure. It was made by me and some of our friends. And the main core, the main basement, let's say, of this uh, exhibition was uh, Edward Bilski archive. And we showed a lot of um, 
material of the history of the Kyiv architecture of the second half of the 20th century that were never showed before. And we focus uh, our idea of this exhibition also to show to the public a project that were never built and some uh, were never built yet uh, or were uh, destroyed somehow. And uh, another example are my friends that are working a lot of with archive of the postmodernist architecture in Ukraine and precisely in Kyiv. And they work a lot uh, with so-called like postmodernism quartals in Kyiv, in Podil district and other places. And they made a conference uh, using a lot of archive materials. They made this uh, beautiful website and as well they publish a new book that upcoming these days. Or another exhibition in the market hall in Kyiv uh, that were made by me uh, with also using a lot of materials of the Kyiv's Niep archive bring me by Viktor Marushinka. And you can see some of these marketplaces and also this exhibition was situated in the marketplace. Or another using of archive of Edward Bilsky and his uh, real estate Vinogradar in Kyiv. And also uh, I'm an activist of preserving this uh, preservation, this architecture in Kyiv that is called Safe Kyiv Modernism. And in all our activities, we use a lot of also archive material. For instance, uh, this uh, building UFO that is called so UFO, we made uh, several exhibitions and this model was made especially by the author of this building, Florian Yuryev, for this exhibition. And now it will be also in the library. Or I made uh, this kind of architectural uh, drawings and you can see on uh, the lower part of this building all archive of uh, Florian Yuryev who was also not an architect but also artist, musician, etc. And then the vertical part, the history and the story of this safe cave modernism movement. And also using a lot of archive materials we produce uh, alternative project of renovation uh, of this uh, UFO for building how it could be done. Uh, we work together with the author of this building, Florian Yuryev. So uh, as a conclusion, I would like to point out a few aspects of archiving. Firstly, for me personally, apart from its scientific value, the archive has also a visual value. All materials, signatures, all the signs of that time and many documents themselves looks like finished kind of art. Unfortunately, there is a war in Ukraine and the preservation of everything is still under great threat. But as I have shown you before, unfortunately, we have to protect everything also from other barbarians, namely developers and businessmen or indifferent relatives. And now, as you know, many young people in Ukraine are trying to save modernist monuments and buildings from developers and destruction. And I would like to say that the archives of those times are as important as the buildings and require protection the same like the architecture itself. Thank you.